open this service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Will you please, please join with me and stand as we sing our opening hymn, hymn number 19 in the blue hymnal, O Come All Ye Faithful, hymn number 19 in the blue hymnal. in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake, Grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, I'll invite you to confess your sins privately uh, to, between you and the Lord. Any sin that is particularly bothering you or that you've been struggling with, I invite you to lay that before the Lord even now. And now hear this from the Lord. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and upon you and has given us his only son to die for us in that sin that we confessed and that you confessed privately as well and has for his sake forgives us of all our sins to them that believe on his name he gives a power to become the sons of god and bestows on them his holy spirit he that believes and is baptized 
shall be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to follow along this morning. Our first lesson this morning comes from the book of Malachi. And it's right before the New Testament, Matthew. Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. That can be found, found on page 1491 of Bibles in your pew, if that helps you out begins titled the day of the lord surely the day is coming it will burn like a furnace all the arrogant and evildoers will, will be stumble stubble and that day that is coming will set them on fire says the lord almighty not a root or a branch will be left to them but for you who revere my name the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. Then you will trample down the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I do these things, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. Here is our first lesson. Our second lesson comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. That can be found on page, found on page 1076 in your pew Bible. Isaiah chapter 11, begin at verse 1. The branch from Jesse. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Here are our lessons for this morning. Our gospel reading for this morning can be found on page 1627 in your pew Bibles. That's Luke chapter 17, verses 20 through 30. Again, that's Luke chapter 17, verses 20 through 30. It can be found on page 1627 in your pew Bibles. I'll invite you to stand out of respect for the gospel. Glory be to thee, o Lord. Luke chapter 17, beginning at verse 20, reading in Jesus' name. Once... Having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, Here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. Then he said to his disciples, The time is coming when you will no longer when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. Men will tell you, There he is, or here he is. Do not go running off after them. 
For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning, which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this regeneration. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage, up to the day of Noah, entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. Here ends the gospel reading for today. Praise be to thee. Would you join with me in confessing our Christian faith together with the words of the Nicene Creed? And these words can be found on page 32 in your blue hymnals. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, Light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Today is the second Sunday of Advent, and so we get to light the second candle here this week, another purple candle. Today marks the second Sunday in Advent. Advent means he comes, and we look forward to Christ's coming in the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. Each Sunday, we will light a candle on the Advent wreath, which symbolizes a great truth about Jesus Christ. Even the Advent wreath itself has symbolic meaning. The circle represents eternal love, and the greenery, everlasting life. This week, we light the second purple candle. The color purple is a color of royalty, showing that Jesus is the King. The second purple candle is called the Bethlehem candle, and it reminds us of the preparations being made to receive and cradle the Christ child who was born a humble king in a manger. From Micah 5, 2, But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. And from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken, while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And so today we light the Bethlehem candle. As we light a new candle each week, we will notice that the light is increasing, which reminds us that the light of the world's arrival is drawing near. Now this time in our service, too, I'll invite Brent. Uh, he is our missionary of a month, uh, Brent and Emily Ron and their family, and he's going to uh, greet you briefly to share about the work in Uganda. Good morning. Good morning. Oh. 
it's great to be here with you, and thanks for the time during Sunday school as well. Uh, we have a display out there in back as well. Uh, we have a prayer card, also a little magnet of the family as well. Uh, my wife and I also wrote out our story. She wrote most of it, so it's a better read. <laughs> I contributed one chapter, uh, but just kind of our story. Um, we went through two miscarriages, and we were first serving in India, uh, but was kind of removed from India. And just going through difficulty, which 2020 has provided that for all of us, hasn't it? in some shape, in some form. And I think so often today's world, we, we go through difficulties and we shake our fist at God instead of saying that, God, actually, you told us that difficulty was going to arise. And praise God that you're in the midst of it. So it's looking at our story and going, God, where were you? And if you're a good God, uh, how did that play out in that story? Um, so feel free to check that out as well. Uh, as John said, we're missionaries in Uganda. Uh, we've been there for three years. We are excited to return June se January 17th, not June. Uh, <laughs> that, that would be a long time. Uh, but excited to return January 17th. We, that will mark about 10 months, us being stateside. Uh, through COVID season. Um, so please pray for us as we get back. We'll be moving back into Jinja, into our house that we've been renting through this time, uh, but also with our eyes focused in Gulu area, northern Uganda, as we look at church planting up there. So thank you again for praying for us, praying for the work of Uganda. Just want to encourage you to continue. Uh, one question that was asked, Kevin, you asked it, uh, what are we called to here in Deschler? And Acts 1-9 is our calling, isn't it? To reach Deschler, to reach uh, Nebraska, and to reach America and to the ends of the world. And that's why God has you here. God called me to Uganda to reach Uganda, but he's called you to be here uh, to reach your neighbors and your friends. And I would just encourage you to continue to keep your eyes on God, keep loving him, keep serving him, and love your neighbor. And that's what Jesus said, wasn't it? Uh, what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so continue on the work. Continue. Don't get distracted by the effects of this world. Don't get distracted by what's going on outside. Keep your eyes focused in on cross. Keep your eyes focused on what John read with the Advent. Christ came, and the light is getting greater. He's coming again. So thank you, guys, and thank you for your love for our family and your prayers for us, and may the Lord bless you. Merry Christmas. We'll keep you up here for a second. We like to... Send the missionaries off and gather around them with coronavirus. We're not going to do that. So I'm going to pray for you, Brent, now on behalf of our congregation. And uh, yeah, Lord, I pray that you'd be with Brent and Emily and Amalia and Sarala and Sarala and for Isaiah as well, Lord, as they get ready to head back to the field that you have called them to. We thank you, Father, for your faithfulness in their lives, walking along with them on this broken road uh, through the ups and downs of life. Father, go before them. Encourage them. Uplift them. Lord, use them for, to do, bring your message to the people in Uganda. Thank you, Father, for Brent and for bringing him here to us today and for the privilege we have to hear about your work around the world. Encourage each one of us in our work with you, Lord, and our walk with you as well. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brother. Mm -hmm. Our next hymn is hymn number 15 in the blue hymnal. Comfort, comfort ye my people. Hymn number 15 in the blue hymnal. Oh uh -huh. 
First of all, I'll preface it this way. There's no way that I wrote my sermon between when Brent just gave Sunday school and now, and we didn't really talk about what he was going to be talking about in Sunday school, but I kind of chuckled to myself thinking it goes right along with what we're talking about today in, in the sermon. So praise God for that. Uh, and we'll get started. The world has changed. Think of how busy you were last December at this time last year. All the events that you had to catch, the school programs, the community happenings, the gatherings with friends, and all of those other things. This year, many of them aren't going to happen. Or people will look down at you for doing them, trying to do some semblance of normalcy from, to keep on as last year. In the past, when walking into a store, you'd be greeted with a friendly hello, or maybe this time you'd be greeted with a Merry Christmas from somebody else, or at least a neutral interaction from others. But now it's different. Every interaction is being assessed. You look around to see who's following the rules and who's the threat to the public health. It's not as simple as it once was. Or if you're of a different conviction, then you look around to see who is blindly giving up their freedom without realizing what's going on, and who's the other freedom fighters here in our midst. Be willing to guess most people are somewhere between the two. But we see this tension in our world around us here. Let's face it, the world has changed. You never would have imagined this being reality 12 months ago. And we could spend more time explaining how the world has changed this year, but I'll leave that for you to do some other time. I have a question for you, though. What caused this change? What was it, what is it, that has disrupted our lives so violently, so forcefully, to cause us to no longer look at one another as fellow human beings, but a threat to human health? Is it a virus? Is it the media? Is it politics? All of these things have been around for a lot longer than the last 12 months. None of these things are new. So what has changed to lead to this pandemic that we find ourselves in? Fear. Fear of death. Fear of illness. 
fear of passing the virus on to someone else, fear of losing our freedoms, fear of the unknown, and the list goes on. And I'm not saying there is no place for this fear. This fear is all uh, unmerited fear. But we recognize that how fear has gripped us. If there wasn't risk and if there wasn't fear, no one would take this virus seriously. The world would have continued on as it has always been doing, doing its own thing. People would have gotten sick, but that's just part of the circle of life, we would have said. But fear has gripped the world, and it seems that it won't be letting go anytime soon. Look at the amount of change caused by this virus, caused by this fear. It's intriguing, to say the least. It makes me ask the question, what would it look like if we treated every other threat in the same way? What would it look like, switch gears a little bit, if we treated spiritual threats in the same way that we've responded to the coronavirus? What if we spent the same amount of energy looking after our own souls or our souls and the souls of our neighbors? What if we love them enough to proclaim the gospel to them? In his second letter, in his second letter Peter cautions his reader about a very real threat that is lurking around us, that is lurking around them, that has continued to lurk around since, ever since before Peter has written this letter. It's a very real threat with eternal consequences, one that the world loves to just ignore. And Christians haven't been much better about it, though. At least we certainly haven't been responding with the same COVID-like response to this reality. Do we really believe it? Do we really recognize the danger that is very real, that can come in a blink of an eye? Are we taking it seriously? Or is it something that we like to keep on the back burner for when we'll need it in the future, whenever that is? I invite you to open up your Bibles with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. So I read verses 1 through 18. And as we read this passage, I invite you to consider Peter's words, recognizing this is the word of God, this is true for now and for always. I invite you to stand out of respect for God's word if you're able. Second Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder, that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with the roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of Scripture, to their own destruction. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, 
but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Father God, these are your words. Your word is truth. We pray this morning, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word. Stir in our hearts, Lord, cause to our minds to be reminded again of who you are, what you have said, and what you have revealed. Help us to believe these truths, Lord. Help us to be on our guard. Help us to grow in the grace and knowledge. Help us to be diligent to be found in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Peter ends this letter with a command for his readers. Be on your guard. It's another command here. It's not up to our own uh, whether we want to do it or not. It's something that every leader, every reader is called to. Whoever you are, wherever you are, however old you are, God calls us to this universally here. It's a call to be on guard against something. And that something is explained for us in verse 17. Be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. Peter had mentioned false prophets in chapter 2, if you remember reading that chapter earlier, who were promising freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. They're promising something that they don't have themselves that they can never offer. They're proclaiming to the people a message that they wanted to hear a message that they wanted to believe, a message that allowed them to act however they wanted to act, a message that allowed them to believe whatever they wanted to believe, a message that allowed them to follow their passions wherever it takes them and to say this is good and glorious and honoring in God's sight, to do what seemed right for them. It's a message we hear today. And all too often, unfortunately, it's a message that is still being proclaimed from pulpits around our own country, saying, do what you want. Don't worry what God has said, but follow your own passions. Do what you want. It's the error of unprincipled men and women which are leading people to abandon their own steadfastness, to abandon their own study of God's word, lulling them to sleep, calling them, causing them to lower their guard before they know it. They're swallowing a poison to their souls that's leading them straight to their damnation. But we don't care because at least the poison tastes good and we want more. Be on guard, Peter says. In the beginning of the chapter, he writes, it's to stir up your sincere mind by way of reminder. And here we're reminded again of the truth and told to think clearly about our present situation. Think clearly about every message you are being told Think clearly about the doctrine you're being fed and to remember the words spoken beforehand and what are those words by the holy prophets and the commandment of our Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Think clearly. Remember God's word. Go back to God's word. Remember the word of God. Remember the truth that was delivered once and for all to all the saints. Remember what God has spoken and study it. Remember the truth, again, that was delivered to you. In Peter's first letter, we're reminded to fix our hope completely on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Fix our hope on that thing. And now in this letter, Peter has to reiterate what he's already said because the people were doubting if that revelation of Jesus Christ was really going to come. They had been waiting for years. They had heard for decades that Jesus was coming again and they were waiting they heard Jesus is coming again soon and very soon and yet their friends would live and they would die and Jesus still hadn't come back yet they were wondering is Jesus ever going to come back the mockers and the scoffers have been asking that question for centuries telling us reminding us saying hey you said Jesus was going to come back soon it hasn't happened yet he's never coming back Believers are beginning to cave in. They're turning their attention from that grace that was to come, that was to always be in front of their face. Again, doubting whether or not Jesus is ever going to come back. And they needed only to look back to the course of their own lives, to look to their experiences, to see that what the mockers were claiming in verse 4, for ever since our fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Saying, you know what, there's something to what they're saying. The world continues on 
as it always has throughout my lifetime, throughout your lifetime, throughout the lifetime of my parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, keep going all the way back to the time of Christ. Life continues on as it is. There is nothing new under the sun. It's the same old, same old. Hey, Judith, go sit back down my mommy. Thanks. <laughs> Except when kids come to the pulpit sometime, that's new. But it's the same old, same old thing. Hear what happens. We look back to our lives and we start to wonder, God, it's been 31 years. You really coming again? For Edna, who turns 95, God, it's been 95 years. When are you coming? I've been waiting a long time. Is Jesus coming? Only to live your whole life to never see his return. It's been the experience of every Christian since Christ's ascension. They've died without seeing his return. So who are we to think that he's really going to come back this time? What makes us so right? History has proved that it's all a lie. That's what the scoffers are saying. As we look back at our own lives, we see, you know what? There's some credit to what they have to say. And it causes us to doubt the eternal hope that we have. It causes us to abandon Christ and his word and for a life of passing pleasures here in this world. The mockers and the scoffers will ask, where is the promise of his coming? Show me the proof. And when's he going to do what he said he would do? And the assumption is that God has forgotten about us down here. Just look in the world. See all the bad stuff that's going on. There's your proof. Where is this almighty, all-powerful, all-loving God when we see what we're going through? When's he going to do what he said he would do? He's forgotten about his promise. Either that or he is completely uninvolved in life. It sets up this God as some far-off deity who doesn't really care about us at all. Doesn't care what's going on in life. The song came out in September of this year as a prayer from all of us down here on this earth calling God, saying, God, we need you. Come in and, and hear our prayers and come and, and act on our behalf now. Where are you, God? And the song is a touching song, but it also gives that impression that God isn't at work in this world today. He's up there, and we had better pray and fast and do all kinds of whatever things that come to our minds so that God would intervene and act here in this world. Again, as though God is distant and he isn't here today that he isn't at work. Giving us the picture that God only comes to our aid when he's prompted to, when he's begged. This is the God that we serve. Yet that's not how God's word has revealed God to be or who God is. In verse 5, Peter reminds us that God was the one who spoke the world into existence. There wasn't anyone saying, hey God, if you could say a few things, that would be really great if I could have some stuff around me now. No, God, moved by his own volition, his own will and determination, said, I'm going to speak. I'm going to make this world happen. And it was. God wanted to see all of creation, and so he spoke it into existence. God created Adam and all the animals. Adam didn't say, you know, God, something's missing here. Could you help me out? No, God saw that there wasn't a helpmate for Adam, and he created Eve. He didn't wait for Adam to say, you know, I've tried all these other things and nothing's really working. I'm lonely. Can you come in and help me out? God works without our prayers. God is always at work in our lives. And then again, at the flood, Noah wasn't praying, God, this place is a train wreck. Can you start over again, please? No, Noah is told by God, this is what I'm going to do. And God saves him and all of his family. God, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and they were ashamed of themselves, guilty, God is the one who speaks the promise of the gospel saying, this is the plan. Trust me, I'm going to make everything all right again. God is the one who moves entirely by grace. and He has promised to us that Savior. God never stopped being involved in this world. He has always been involved. He has provided for our needs daily. The air that we are breathing right now, God provides. The food that we eat, God provides. The safety and security we enjoy comes from the hands of God. The weather that we enjoy, the seasons, the sunrises, the sunsets, all of these are because God is at work in the world around us. The mockers will tell us and ignore God's hand in creation and say, that's just Mother Earth doing her thing. God set it into motion, but he doesn't really care what's going on. But God is daily 
providing for your needs, for your physical needs. You're also your spiritual needs too. God is actively involved and engaged in this world, so much so that he even took on flesh to put his own skin in the game, quite literally. As Paul writes in Galatians, and when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son so that he might redeem those who were under law, that we might receive adoption as sons. And God has been at work in this world calling us back to himself since the very beginning, actively working out our salvation, delivering us from sin, delivering us from death and from the devil. And he's at it still today. And this is why Jesus hasn't returned yet. Look at verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Every day we've been given that Christ does not return doesn't mean that he isn't returning. It doesn't mean that he has forgotten. Every day we've been given that Christ does not return means that God is graciously and patiently waiting for more souls to be saved. And that he is still at work in our hearts, in our lives, in our world today, calling people to repentance and faith. He is still at work transferring them from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. So that when Jesus returns, they'll be ready. He hasn't forgotten. He is still at work saving souls. The time is coming, though, when the Lord will destroy the heavens, the earth, and all of its works. Everything that we work so hard to accomplish here on this earth is going to be brought to nothing. That job that you've been putting so much time and energy and focus into won't be around anymore. The trophies, promotions, social standing, whatever else it is that we spend so much time chasing after in this life isn't going to be around. And here's the one that we don't want to think about, but we must think about. The people around us. The ones that we care about and we love so dearly. If they don't know Jesus, if they don't believe in him, they too will perish. And what about you? How will it be for you? Will the God that you're pursuing be able to save you? Will the God that you believe in be able to rescue you? And if that God is anything other than Jesus Christ and the Christ revealed to us in Scripture, that God is useless. So do you know Jesus, the Christ of Scripture? God Almighty in the flesh who came to save and redeem you. Is he the Christ of Scripture or is he the Messiah of your own concoction? Jesus is coming again and when he does, it'll be a day of judgment and destruction for all who are trusting in other gods. You recognize the danger behind those words, behind this truth. We ought to be acting or responding in a much more urgent way than the coronavirus response. This is the very real danger that Peter is warning us about. Remember what God has said. Remember who Jesus is and don't let anyone, false teachers or even your own false ideas and assumptions and beliefs, turn you away from this truth. He is coming again. He is coming soon. So since everything in this life is temporary, the question comes, does it even matter how we live in this life? It's all going to burn up anyways. Yes, it does. Peter says how we ought to live here. Be holy in conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. And a godly life is a life that is lived in submission to God. A godly life is a life that is lived in faith before God as well. And it doesn't necessarily look like you have all your ducks in a row. A godly life doesn't mean that you'll never sin again, but when we sin, we run to Christ in repentance and forgiveness. A godly life is a life in submission to all of what God has said, not just avoiding sins, but to all the different one another commands in Scripture that he has called us to. Confess your sins to one another. Love one another. Bear one another's burdens. These are things that God has called us to. This is what a godly life looks like. And we do this because he is coming again soon. 
We aren't living for this world and for this life alone. We're not living for our own status, for our own comfort alone. But what he writes in verse 17, according to God's promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Because our hope is beyond this temporary life, we can say no to the desires that our flesh puts in front of us. We can say that we are looking forward to a fuller, a longer, a much greater satisfaction than this world will ever offer. A place where righteousness dwells, where there is no curse of sin. And because of this, or therefore, as it says in verse 14, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Be diligent to be found by him in peace. And that peace only comes from one place. Being spotless and blameless is only found in one place. Being holy is only found in one place. And it's not by our own actions or our own merit. But that holiness is God-given by trusting in Jesus whose blood cleanses us from all sin, who gives us to us his own righteousness. And by trusting in Jesus who himself has made peace with God on our behalf, by trusting in the one who has given to us the Holy Spirit, who is constantly at work in our lives, giving us faith and forgiving us our sins. All of this is a call to faith in Jesus, our crucified and risen Savior and coming King. We don't stop there, though. To be made sure that we are in peace, to be diligent, to be found in peace, spotless and blameless, we don't just say, all right, I've done enough or I've received it enough here. We can't afford to just stay in place. There is no staying in place. We have to, as Peter concludes, or if we're going to be biblical Christians here, again, this is a command for every Christian, regardless of your age, ability, standing, whatever it is. In his letter, Peter writes these words, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what God commands us to do, each one of us, to continually and always be growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus because that danger of falling from our own steadfastness is real. And we fall away before we even notice it. When we find ourselves in a place where we don't care anymore about that sin, we're not going to confess it, we're not going to repent it, repent of it. It doesn't bother us. The danger is real, and it's lurking around. So grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The drifting away from the one who saves us to follow after other ideas is far more deadly than any virus or any terrorist can bring. Beware, Peter writes, and grow. Be diligent to be found in Christ. Recognize and reject the false teachings. So why does this matter? It matters because the coming of Jesus is coming. The Lord comes, and when he does, because he is coming again, when he comes, the earth and all of its works will be burned up. The danger is real, and it will affect everyone living on this earth instantaneously at the same time. So look for Christ's return. The temptation for us is to be complacent, to be lazy, to be content with where we are, where we've been, or what, whatever it is that you've done. Yet that's not what God demands of us here in his word. He calls us to continually grow. So take those necessary precautions. Study God's word. And don't be lazy or complacent. Don't chase after those things that won't last. But pursue Christ. Study his word. Live how he has called us to live. Grow in him. Share this message with those around you, those people that you care so deeply about, and even the ones you don't care for as well, because Christ is coming again. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father God, we do thank you for your word and for its truth. Lord, we pray that you would light a fire behind us, underneath us, inside of us, that we would recognize that you are coming quickly, that each day that you don't come back, Lord, is a day of grace which you have given to us to proclaim your word, to share with the lost and dying world, Lord. Lord, a world who will see the end of destruction, 
and for, will perish for all eternity, Lord, if they don't know you. We pray that you would give us a love for lost souls, a passion for reaching the lost as well. Father, that you would bring this love and compassion in our own hearts, that we would have your eyes, that we would have your compassion. Father, we pray that you would teach us to study your word, to learn your word. Father, forgive us for our complacency. Forgive us for our laziness. Forgive us, Lord, for not doing the work that you have called us to do. But God, we also thank you and praise you for providing a Savior for us, for our fallenness, for our sinful ways, who has come to cleanse us and forgive us and to give us your righteousness. We praise you for that hope. Lord, may we bring this message to all of those around us that there is forgiveness and salvation with you and with you alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This time in our service, again, I'll remind you of the offering. The offering in the basket on the pedestal is for a church offering, and the offering in the plate on the table in the back is for our missionaries, Brent and Emily Ron. Uh, if you'd like to contribute to their ministry, and again, uh, talk with Brent afterwards and look at the resources that he has brought for us here. Today is Communion Sunday, and we'll uh, continue with the processional way that we've done it in the past. And Brent will be up here to help me uh, administer the sacraments to you, to give to you Christ's body and blood. And you'll take it, someone, you'll be ushered out to take it, put the blast, plastic cup in the basket, and then go ahead and walk to your seat. We'll do the dismissal at the end together. If you are burdened and you feel your weakness, go joyfully to the sacrament and let yourself be refreshed, comforted, and strengthened. For if you wait until you are rid of your burden in order to come to the sacrament purely and worthily, you'll have to stay away from it forever. In such a case, he pronounces the verdict, If you are pure and upright, you have no need of me, and I also have no need of you. Therefore, the only ones who are unworthy are those who do not feel their burdens nor admit to being sinners. So if you are burdened by your sin, Christ invites you to come. Receive this forgiveness once again. You don't need to be a member to commune with us, but you do need to be baptized and instructed in the faith so that you might examine yourself as Christ has commanded us to do. Dearly beloved, as we purpose to come to the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, we should carefully examine ourselves as St. Paul exhorts us. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. For this holy sacrament has been instituted for the special comfort and strengthening of those who humbly confess their sins and who hunger and thirst after righteousness. But if we do examine ourselves, we shall find nothing in us but sin and death from which we cannot set ourselves free. Therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ has had mercy on us and has taken on himself our nature that he might fulfill for us the whole will and law of God, and for our deliverance suffer death and all that we through our sins deserve. And to the end that we should confidently believe this and be strengthened by our faith, he has instituted the holy sacrament of his supper, in which he feeds us with his body and gives us to drink of his blood. Therefore, whoever eats of this bread and drinks of this cup, firmly believing the words of Christ, dwells in Christ and Christ in him, and he has eternal life. We should also do this in remembrance of him, of his death, and how he was delivered for our sins and raised for our justification. And with grateful hearts, we should take up our cross and follow him. And according to his commandment, love one another, even as he has loved us. For we are all one bread and one body, even as we are partakers of this one bread and drink of this one cup. Will you join with me in praying the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had eaten and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The table is set, and Christ invites you to come. Lord bless you and keep you, Evan. Lord bless you and keep you, Judith. Lord bless you and keep you, Marjorie. Blood of Christ shed for you. Can you sit down? Can you come back and sit down? 
blood of Christ shed for Samuel. Blood of Christ shed for Kevin. Blood of Christ shed for Marilyn. Blood of Christ shed for Willis. Our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who now has bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all of your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith unto everlasting life. Peace be with you. Amen. And let us give thanks and pray. We thank you, our almighty and everlasting God, for having refreshed us with these your gracious gifts. We ask for your infinite mercy to strengthen our Christian faith, Support us in the trials of life and make us fervent in our love for you and to our fellow men. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. you to join with me and stand as we sing our closing hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King, hymn number 157 in the blue hymnal. again.